Hi, I am Laura, as she just told you, uh, and I am here to talk today a little bit about imagination. Um, I want to share with you a little bit of my story of an accidental journey into entrepreneurship, and I want to give you my take on imagination and how it has shaped my business and how it shaped our lives. I'm here to tell you today that if you dream big, if you assume failure at all times, uh, if you work really, 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 really hard, drink a lot, and uh, <laughs> if you stay flexible, that your imagination can take you places that you've never quite imagined. So let's start with me. So as I said, my name's Laura, and I sell yarn for a living. Um, how many other people here sell yarn for a living? Um, yeah, see? It's nice to be in a niche. Um, so I sell yarn for a living. Truth be told, we sell a lot of yarn. Um, my husband and I opened our shop, Jimmy Bean's Wool, in 2002 in Truckee, and since then we have sold almost one billion feet of yarn, um, just like McDonald's, only they haven't figured out how to uh, power a car from, like, yarn grease, um, but we'll get there. Um, so we've sold almost a billion feet of yarn. We've been featured in the New York Times. We've been in the Wall Street Journal. CNN has done a video on us. Um, we have a college scholarship that we've given out over $30,000. We are the first official yarn supplier to the U.S. snowboard and U.S. ski teams. Um, first one, they never had one before. I can't imagine why. Um, we are an official partner of the Heart Truth, which is a little red dress on the Diet Coke cans. So we've sold a lot of yarn. Um, and is this something that I ever imagined that I would be doing? No, never. In fact, my husband and I always laugh. Uh, he's got a finance degree. I have a criminal justice degree. Um, and we always laughed at, like, out of all the careers that we could have possibly imagined, owning a yarn shop and selling yarn for a living was not even on the list of the 100 top careers we could not imagine having. <laughs> um, truth be told, since uh, we've had lunch and we're friends now, um, or with some of you, if I haven't offended you yet, um, truth be told, I always wanted to be on stage and I've always wanted to be an actress, uh, but I never, it never, ever, ever occurred to me that this would be the stage and that I would be talking and giving a performance on yarn and business. <laughs> but I think that's the point, that as long as you imagine what could be, and for me it's being on stage, and then you let fate take its course, life will take you someplace that could be way more magical than anything you could have ever thought of. You just have to be flexible and open-minded enough to let it go there. So let me back up a little bit. So there's yarn. There is our official uh, sponsored athlete. We sponsor a snowboarder. I'm going to back up a little bit and give you guys some, uh, some info. So my husband and I, in the year 2000, we were living in San Francisco. We were software engineers. We were riding the whole dot-com thing, making more money than we were worth, uh, and decided, you know, when the bubble burst, we decided to leave and to move to Truckee, which is an obvious choice. Uh, and I decided that in Truckee, um, my husband got a job in Sacramento. He would not allow me to commute because he figured our marriage wouldn't last if I was in the car an hour and a half each way. And um, so he preferred that I try to do something at home. So I found um, that I was going to put together a software consulting business. Truckee seemed the perfect place to do it. So I'm trying to build websites for people. I'm trying to, you know, hawk my wares and, uh, and build all these systems for people. And, you know, lo and behold, it didn't quite take off because apparently the software business in Truckee is not quite as robust as it is in San Francisco, if you can imagine, which I had not. Um, so I'm sitting there, I'm feeling the effects of failure, and I, uh, I'm thumbing through this knitting magazine, probably a glass of wine in my hand. It was probably at least after three. Um, glass of wine in my hand, I'm thumbing through this knitting magazine because I just learned how to knit before we moved to Truckee, and I was obsessed, super obsessed. So thumb through it, get to the back, and there's this ad for Lorna's Laces Yarns. And I noticed two things about this ad. One was that they didn't have a website, and this was in 2001. Two was that they were nearby. They were in Somerset, California, and this was back in the days when I had to like look on a map. They had these pieces of paper with like, you know, drawings on it and stuff, and I figured out where Somerset was. So I called this lady and I said, hi, you don't have a website. I love to knit. I build websites. I would love, 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 love to build a website for you. She said no. I said, okay, well, all right, accept failure. I'm okay with failure. She said, but you know what? Call me back in three months. So I said, all right. So, you know, I set my timer. I sat there for three months, called her back. Hey, it's me again. Thanks for answering. Um, can I build a website for you? And she said, yes. And so I did. And so we became friends. And so she convinced me that Truckee needed a yarn shop. I mean, come on, last thing in the, you know, in the world that I ever, ever, ever imagined doing. So, I, uh, I come home that day, and I tell Doug, I'm like, you know what? Lorna thinks I should open a yarn shop. She really thinks it would be a great idea. There's nothing for miles. There's nothing for, like, 60 or 95 miles. 
And normally Doug just kind of laughs and says, oh, that's a cute idea, you know, because I have like a thousand different ideas all the time. He's like, wow, well, that's a good idea. Why don't you figure out how much it would cost and, and let's, let's think about it. I'm like, oh my God, you replied. Like normally, you know, we just go to sleep and wake up the next morning. So I figured out how much it would cost. We opened it. Um, we ended up opening this 500 square foot shop. It was called Jimmy Beans. Well, it still is. Um, Jimmy is my nickname. It's from an old Todd Snyder, well, 10 year old Todd Snyder song. It's what my husband has called me since we met. Um, he's called me Laura like twice and those were not good times. Um, <laughs> beans is for coffee because when we started, we like to hedge our bets and we had half yarn, half coffee. And I had also done the website for an espresso cart manufacturer and convinced him to trade me my work for an espresso cart. And all our friends left. Well, and wool is, I mean, right. Um, so the beans part, uh, all our friends were laughing at. I mean, they're, they always laugh at me. But um, they were laughing. They're like, oh, you know, that yarn thing, that's going to be really cute. But Trekkie really needs, you know, a coffee shop. So this is going to take off. So anyway, so uh, um, things progressed. Six months later, you know, we opened the shops, small. Six months into it, you know, we're software engineers. Doug's working in Sacramento. He's working full time. And at night, he's working on a website for our business. So... I'm at work because we figured we should supplement store sales with a little bit of online sales. We'll try it. It's 2002. So all of a sudden, one day, I'm in the shop, and I check my email, and there's an order. One online order. And I don't think I can cuss here, but um, I almost peed my pants. Um, it was, and I'm like, oh my God, we got an order. We got an order. I called Doug immediately. We got an order. We got an order. Like, what do I do? We got an order. So I fill the order real fast and then I run home and grab a couple beers out of the you know, refrigerator, get in the hot tub and we sit down and we're like, we got an order. We got an order. What if we got an order every single day? Could you imagine if we got one order every single day? I mean, we did it. We got one. If we got an order every single day, that would change our lives. And so we got up early the next morning. I mean, I'm pumped. I'm jazzed. I'm ready to go to work. We start getting a few orders. We're starting to get an order every day. And I am shipping those orders out. I'm staying. I'm working 10, 12, 14 hours a day. Work hard. Um, you know, getting those orders out as fast as I can. And all of a sudden, one day, we get five orders. And I come home. We pop a couple beers, get in the hot tub. We have five orders. What if we got five orders every day? Get up really early the next morning, work, 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 you know, work as hard as we can, getting those orders out as fast as we can. All of a sudden, we get 10 orders. Then we get 20 orders a day. And then something happened. Doug was able to quit his full-time job. And our life did change because we kept working super, super hard. So fast forward, five, well, and I was going to say that we still play this game. So last month, we got 1,000 orders one day. We came home, popped some beers. We don't have a hot tub anymore. It's actually in our warehouse full of yarn. If you guys want to come take a dip, um, full disclosure. But, you know, we pretended we were in our hot tub. We still drank the beers. Can you imagine? What if we get a thousand orders every single day? This is, did I mention that we sell yarn? I mean, it's unbelievable, right? I, I've never worked retail. I just learned how to knit. I don't have any business experience. I don't know what the hell I'm doing, you know, and we're just, we're just doing it. So anyway, fast forward, 2007, we've been in business for five years. Um, we've got two stores at this point. I got about five employees. I finally have some help and uh, things are starting to plateau. We're doing about a million dollars in business a year, trying to figure out what we're going to do. And uh, I go to dinner in Sonoma with some friends. And I'm going to start talking fast because I'm running out of time, but just bear with me. Um, so go to dinner with some friends in Sonoma. We go to this restaurant called The Girl and the Fig. Nice restaurant, great, really good food, not life-changing. Get home, open up, uh, happen to get the mail that day, open up this magazine, Fortune Small Business, that used to get distributed to all business members of Costco. Open it up, and there is a five-page article about The Girl and the Fig grab some beers, get in the hot tub. I'm like, damn it, Doug, if these guys can get in Fortune Small Business, so can we. I mean, no offense, Mark Essie, but uh, you know, restaurants are kind of boring, right? Everybody writes about restaurants. <laughs> like biotech is so 2005. Um, you know, yarn is beautiful, it's amazing, it's exciting. And I swear to God that everybody that reads this magazine is gonna know somebody that knits and this is gonna change our lives. So I wake up the next morning as early as I can and I put together this pitch and I send it off to the Fortune Small Business editors. I'm so excited, I mean, we are about to change our lives. And I hit F5, which is the refresh button, because I sent the email off. It's been a minute, and I haven't gotten a reply. I am <laughs> bummed. It's been I hit it again. I called Doug. I'm like, they haven't replied. They, don't, they hate me. This sucks. It's been 10 minutes. No reply. All right, two hours. No reply. End of the day. My confidence is just shattered. One day later, and my balloon is starting to deflate. Two days later, I've already forgotten. Because, <laughs> see, they call me a squirrel at work because I'm so excitable and I'm always like going to the next thing and next thing. And, you know, I, I forget about failure. Like, I'm always moving on to the next thing so quickly. And I, I fail 99 times out of 100. So I don't even remember that I failed because I forgot that I tried in the first place. <laughs> um, 
so anyway, so four days into it, forgotten all about it. One of the girls says, hey, Laura, there's a, there's a call for you. There's some guy from Fortune Small Business. Do you want to take it? I'm like, uh, yes. So three experts later, a writer, a pro photographer in a few months, we are in the mailbox of every business owner or every business member of Costco. Five-page article, yarn, me, I'm famous. I'm almost on stage. I mean, I'm getting there. Um, it, was, it was unbelievable. But do you know what the interesting thing was? Because I had imagined that. What I hadn't imagined is that this woman in New York would pick up this magazine and open it and give me a call and say, you know what, I'm a knitter and I loved your story and I'm doing an Emmy swag suite next month. Would you be interested in coming bringing yarn and giving it to the Hollywood stars? Uh, yeah, <laughs> sure. So we go. Still, you know, I've got all this imagine, you know, I'm like, people tell me I look like Hillary Swank. So I'm like, I'm going to be a Hillary Swank body double. I'm going to get discovered. This is going to be my big break. Like, Doug, you know, what if this is what it was all about? You know, I mean, we go into this whole thing. I'm like, or Jennifer Garner. I mean, somebody, you know, I mean, I kind of look like a lot of them, right? Or Nev Campbell. I mean, I can do all this stuff. I could do, like, you know, I'm going to make $30,000 a day. It's going to be amazing. It didn't work out that way, but that's okay. Because I went there and I taught, oh, here, hold on. Uh, Scott Bayo, Tim Daly, Ernie Hudson. Um, Judd Nelson from The Breakfast Club. I taught all of these guys how to knit. And when I went home, I was so jazzed that I go home and I put together this, you know, this, uh, this pitch and this whole campaign that's Hollywood hunks love to knit. Hollywood hunks knit for charity. And I sent it out to everybody in our industry. And everybody in our industry started going nuts. And that's what catapulted us to success. That's what took us from a million dollars and 50 orders a day to where we are now, to 50 employees, 20,000 square feet of space, and 1,000 orders on a big day, on the biggest day. Um, and what's interesting to me about that is that that is not what I had pictured. That's not what I had imagined. What I had imagined was being in Fortune Small Business, was Costco coming to me saying, can you guys do some kind of yarn line? That Macy's coming, I want to do a ready to wear. I mean, that's where my tunnel, you know, that's where my focus was. But because we were flexible enough and I just keep, you know, again, I'm a squirrel. I just go where the nuts are. Okay, that sounds really bad. Uh, um, that was not scripted. And I, sorry, Doug. Um, that's my husband. Anyway, but you know, you just, you got to go where the, where the water flows. Um, you know, and keep it going. And, and that's where we ended up, and that's what ended up catapulting us to success. So how does this apply to you? I mean, you know, hopefully none of you guys are going to sell yarn because I really don't want any competitors. Um, but let me tell you a story about, and I'm going to try and make this work. Okay, this kid. His name's Huckleberry. I know, can you imagine somebody named their kid that? <laughs> um, that's, that's my kid. Two and a half years old. We get on an airplane, or we're taking, he's about to take his first flight. And uh, we're standing at the gate, and a pilot walks by. I said, Huck, go, go ask the pilot if you can get in the cockpit. And he kind of looks at me, and my husband is from the Midwest, so he's totally not like that at all. He's like, oh, you can't do that. I'm like, dude, just do it. Like, ask him. See, I mean, what's the worst that can happen? He's going to say no. I said, realistically, he's probably going to say no. But could you imagine if he said yes? Could you imagine, Huck? I mean, he might let you press a button. He might give you a set of wings. I mean, who knows what he could do? So Huck goes up. He's got my personality. And he goes up. He says, hey, because he could talk at two and a half. He's like, hey, can I get in the cockpit? And the pilot says, yes. Wouldn't you know he sat in that damn thing for 15 minutes? The guy let him push. I mean, Doug's all jealous. He's like, can I get in there? You know, I mean, he's pushing all these things. All these other kids are whining and crying. They're like, why didn't I get to sit in the cockpit? Because you didn't ask. Right? My hope... For my kid, my son, um, is that the next time, and I should say that he's three and a half now, and 80% of the time he is in the cockpit. I mean, it's just a given. Now his confidence is so high, but he's cool because when they do say no, he's not heartbroken. He assumes failure. I mean, we assume that they're not going to let him because then it's always a pleasant surprise when they do. And my hope for him is that he is flexible enough in life that when that pilot, the next time that pilot says no, he accepts that failure gracefully, and he says, no problem, thank you. And that pilot turns around and says, you know what? I can't get you in the cockpit right now, but I could get you in the cargo area. And Huck will say, sweet. And they go down to the cargo area, and there are lions and tigers and bears and a circus, you know, and popcorn and, and cotton candy and all kinds. I mean, way, way cooler than the cockpit. And if he had said no and gotten stuck in this tunnel vision of wanting to be in the cockpit, I want to be in the cockpit, I want to be in the cockpit, 
he would have missed out on this whole damn circus that's underneath the plane. Like how cool, you know, I mean, if you got, you got to stay flexible. So um, I guess the moral of the story is, one, if I can sell a billion dollars, or sorry, I wish. <laughs> um, <laughs> Freudian slip. If I can sell a billion feet of yarn, you, anybody can do anything. And secondly, all you have to do is dream big and then go with the flow because you never know where the flow is going to take you. Thank you.